వన్ మినిట్లో స్టార్ట్ అవుతుంది Good morning. My name is Nikita Dhanthi. And my name is Ashwat Rajkumar. And we will be anchoring today's event. A warm welcome to all the respected teachers and parents present here at the 2021 UK exhibition held by IBDP Year 2 students. We sincerely thank each and every one of you for attending this event. For the past year, TOK has been a roller coaster ride. From not knowing what it was to be part of an interactive session with our classmates, we have come a long way. We're excited for you to join us in our journey. TOK is known to you as one of the core components of the IB curriculum as it prompts us to question not only what we're learning, but the process of what the process of learning encompasses. Today, we in order to show what we have observed from our time in IB diploma program. We would like to commence today's event with a solemn prayer song in order to start the event with positive energy, which motivates us to get through the hard times and come out stronger. Excellence and service is our motto, and as Christites, we strive to uphold it. Pursuit of excellence, social responsibility, love of fellow beings, moral uprightness, and faith in God are our core values. Submission to the greater power of Almighty gives us wisdom and builds humility. All these ideas are beautifully captured in our prayer song. So as is the tradition, let us start our day by taking the blessings of the Almighty.
we would now like to invite our respected diploma coordinator Sheila Chako ma'am to speak a few words before we commence the exhibition. As the diploma program coordinator, she has supported us through our academic journey by helping us achieve our academic objectives through her guidance and has helped us in every imaginable way possible. This guidance has been incredibly instrumental in our IB diploma program. Therefore, we would like you to speak a few words as we commence this TOK exhibition. Now. Sorry, ma'am, we can't Sheila, hear you. Sheila, ma'am, you're on mute, ma'am. So good morning, all of you. It's a great day, and I hope uh, our parents are also part of this uh, celebration. Uh, dear parents, teachers, students, probably I have to just uh, put things in context. Uh, my dear children, you have uh, spent, say, 16 years of your life. I, am I not audible? Yeah. Uh, you're audible. You are, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So 16 years of life, little experience, okay? And you're shaping your personality around it. You're shaping your outlook around it. And the only reason why that is getting shaped is because of the world around you. And world around you is an ecosystem of knowledge. Now, why International Baccalaureate Program has theory of knowledge as one of the flagship course is because that ecosystem of knowledge around you should actually help you to be a very, very purposeful and thoughtful inquirer, okay, to solve the problems of the world. And you, I was speaking to students. No, I have to salute those visionaries who could think that this kind of course at the age of 15 to 16 is important. When we think of the theory of knowledge, we think it's only in the philosopher's domain. Those who are grown old, have gray hairs or taken uh, lots of degrees and they are in the uh, universities, they only can think of it. No, I be never thought of that. And I'm sure you are the lucky lot to go through it. And parents, can you ever imagine that you can see your children's question and answer? Because this is an assessment. You can see their answers today. You can see their questions today. And you know where your child stands. You can be so proud of it. So this is an assessment, open assessment. So I would like to actually thank PM Vergis and our uh, Arjuna ma'am, TOK coordinator, to have brought you to this level of you know, presenting your work to IB. And I'm sure in all the theory of knowledge classes, there, there was an effort where you had consolidated, connected, compared the knowledge and you developed an outlook or developed a, a kind of a metacognitive thinking, you know, a thinking which is different. And we are today celebrating uh, parents, teachers, students, your creativity, your intellectual achievements, your academic achievements, your pursuits. And I only can just hope that there is no looking back. You are on the right path, way forward, and you, you are going to uh, defeat all the challenges and opportunities, which are uh, challenges and difficulties which are facing you with this powerful tool of knowledge, which today you have already adorned. And there is no stop to it. So parents, I just want to know, did you really enjoy this journey of this TOK presentation exhibition along with your children? Have they discussed anything with you? Were you part of it? And, uh, I could see uh, Mr. Sridhar, Mr. Rajkumar, on, on, were you part of it? And really, did you enjoy? Did you feel that it was so different for my child to go through this journey of self-discovery and exploration of this kind? Can one parent give me a testimony? Uh, 
Uh, this is Jimmy. I am uh, Sylvia's father. Good morning, uh, sir. Hello. Uh, I would um, definitely say the last one or two weeks has been quite a revelation for my to to see my daughter what she is really capable of. Mm. Uh, you know, post the COVID situation she went through, I think this kind of an encouragement was well required because at times you really start doubting how much can you stretch, and I guess the ability for her to think out of the box. a uh, stretch beyond her horizon has been a very critical part for us and i really felt proud of what she was able to achieve uh, as part of uh, this engagement and the kind of depth of reading and understanding that she was able to bring in i think it's been quite transformative i would say thank you sir thank you so much and uh, uh, this is what as a community as a school community we would like our parents to be engaged with us and appreciate and celebrate along with us so th thank you for taking some time out of your schedule and being part of us uh, all the best is anything else somebody wanted to say anything so i think we have to start our assessment so thanking all of you children all the best and i i know i just heard it just uh, a few minutes before their presentation it, it's just amazing and i can't think at this age of mine i can also think that way so really at a different level my children are or your boards are so let us all clap and open the assessment can we just applaud ourselves children parents and students and teachers for what we all have and in that spirit i think uh, i hand over the floor to uh, dr rachana mathur who will be taking our children through assessment and probably her introductory uh address to all of us thank you sir thank you so much thank you children thank you ma'am for your words we truly are lucky to be a part of the ib program and we aim to be appreciative individuals to the ecos ecosystem of knowledge around us as carers and knowers i would now like to welcome our tok coordinator dr arjuna mathur who has been a guiding light for us not only while hosting this event but throughout our tok journey theory of knowledge was a subject area that was unfamiliar to nearly all of us while entering our ib diploma year 1 however archana ma'am through the her counsel and her classes helped us develop an aptitude to understand the concepts of tok without her this event would not have been possible archana ma'am we invite you to speak a few words about this tok exhibition yeah thank you shira ma'am thank you ashwath nikita and uh, to introduce tok a bit to our parents and you know this is a very important day so good morning and welcome all uh, especially my uh, ib teachers uh, colleagues who are so enthusiastic and ever um, helpful um, and all the community uh, teaching non teaching uh, at i cdc ib dp and uh, and of course parents who are special invitees for the, this day and i welcome to have a look at the exhibition which i called as knowers uh, knower as our children are knower and they are at the edge of knowing lot of other things um, as we strive for our mission of holistic development of our students at cdc having this even this one step in the direction to facilitate clear thinking among our students as they are going to be global citizens and they are doing so uh, very well finally this is our day of tok exhibition uh, which allows me to offer to rest of the parent and teacher community a tangible illustration of what we do in tok a few minutes before uh, to this second year students were engaged with their junior counterparts to allow them the opportunity to gain a clear picture of the kind of products they will be creating understanding the assessment points and model their own exhibition when the their time comes i hope that this will reduce the stress associated with uncertainty of ib learning and this would have made their job much easier by your children now Uh, i want also to bring your notice a fact that no one here expects children of age 16 or 17 to speak 
and think like scientists or grown-ups, but teachers and parents alike want them to be logical in their actions and in their thinking. But this kind of thinking is not innate, as we know that critical thinking has to be inculcated. It has to be uh, given training about. And we human can overcome our common sense style of thinking. Um, that That is what the TOK course imply and foster in IB. So TOK pushes our students to come out of the shackles of the biological, um, uh, biological theme of our uh, body and you might be agreeing to me that this biological thinking guides us towards emotional thinking and make high generalization of out of our experiences leading to confirmation bias in our thinking decision making and action now tok wants to break open those shackles for your children with a variety of de depth of knowledge and expertise of yourself, our uh, teaching community. I am sure that this learning process through this event will foster a strong sense of pride of uh, my TOK students for their individual uh, achievements, whether it is academic or creative. Uh, for TOK exhibition, I would like to tell you that in the learning IB uh, learning process, which is a rigorous process, TOK students stop and think in TOK classes. But besides getting to practice critical thinking, this process of stopping and thinking on different issues uh, makes them a good thinker. A good thinker, I mean a critical thinker. Uh, this exhibition is one of the process and attempt en route to our students for their uh, high end diploma program. For this task, students have taken initiative to post this exhibition uh, with real objects. Now, real objects uh, were not physical in this current scenario, so you will have images of those objects. And these objects have to be connected to the 35 challenging prompts which are already provided in the TOK course. Uh, for example, these, these prompts are in form of a statement or a question. Um, I'll give you a few examples to you. In what ways do values affect the production of knowledge is the question. Uh, on what grounds uh, might we doubt a claim? Again, a question. Uh, so therefore, these kind of questions and statements appear in their syllabus. Uh, for them to unpack and understand knowledge and world around them. So basically this, this uh, event is that how our students have um, learned about their world, their, their small but young but vibrating world. Our written commentary is also accompanied with each object. One child has to uh, pick up three objects and each object has its own commentary which is connecting to the these uh, TOK questions which are called as prompts and thematic issues which we they have learned in the TOK course. Uh, they are they were also encouraged to link their objects objects which they have uh, picked up to their experiences and academic lives in uh, in the school. So academic lives of children and personal life of children uh, act as a springboard for, for identifying and connecting to the outer world, uh, which is totally different. Uh, in order to facilitate that, all students had been working tirelessly past two months and specifically um, eight hour, uh, eight uh, weeks passed uh, to create the art step gallery, uh, which they have titled as Knowers at Edge. Each set of object includes students sharing their commentary with us. Uh, so why to wait? Head over to the site to check out with Ashwath and Nikita what they are showing us today. Thank you. I hope you will enjoy and encourage our uh, 
students there will be a session which uh, after after the exhibition where you can interact with your children directly thank you ashwath and nikita please come in and take over thank you ma'am for your words tok has truly formed a core part of our ib curriculum in our tok classes we have partaken in a thoughtful and purposeful inquiry into different ways of knowing and into different ways of knowledge exploring new concepts and new questions the exhibition today aims to assess how we as students can apply the tok concepts to the real world each student has selected three specific items that he or she will be discussing in regard with an external prompt that would be introduced in the discussion we hope this exhibition is able to reveal our understanding of tok and is enjoyable for you if you do have any questions during the exhibition for the entire class or one specific student we encourage you to send it in the chat box we will take up these questions during the interactive session preceding the tok exhibition we will also post a pdf with a list of students that and their chosen prompts in order of their presentation without further ado we will now start the exhibition Hi everyone. Welcome to the TOK exhibition of the class of 2021 to 2022. Now we're at edge of knowledge. In this exhibition, we'll each be showing you the three objects we've chosen and the prompt correlating with it. Each object has a special significance that connects to us to our own real life as well as the world. In other words, it shows us how TOK manifests in the world around us. We have integrated the TOK themes, now we're in knowledge, now we're in technology, no one in politics and all our OKs it has enabled us to demonstrate the application of our skills and knowledge and at the same time pursue our personal interests without further ado let's take a step into our exhibition hi My name is Nishant and this is an overview of my theory of knowledge exhibition. In this exhibition, I will attempt to explore the prompt in what ways do values affect the production of knowledge. To do this, I have chosen three objects. The first object I have chosen is the composite ground floor plan of the Burj Khalifa. Having witnessed its construction firsthand, the peculiar shape of the skyscraper's foundation always led me to question the feasibility in upholding such a massive structure. A documentary I watched about its construction outlined the obstacles that builders had to confront in order to erect it successfully, such as wind, heat, and mass. This object links to the prompt, as it it is a case in which the production of knowledge took a detour due to technical and scientific barriers. Furthermore, this object plays a particularly important role in this exhibition, as it highlights how certain values, here scientific and technical, that govern certain areas of knowledge, the natural sciences. solidify the production of knowledge specifically it helps explain how the culmination of a priori or knowledge derived from the world and a posteriori or experiential knowledge help create ex- explicit knowledge the second object i have chosen is the molecular structure of dna at the vishweshwara museum my observation of this structure marks my first ever visit to a science museum Reading the signboards beneath it and later discussing the origins of its discovery during TOK discussions in biology class, I learned that understanding the structure and function of DNA was an integral step in identification of pathogens. This links my object to the prompt as it explains how the production of knowledge is driven by the core value of survival. Um upon further research I read that Wilkins, Watson and Crick, the researchers credited for the discovery of DNA, were shared pictures of the B4 molecule revealing its double helix structure without the permission of Franklin, the researcher who was later recognized for her work in X-ray diffraction. This justifies the object's inclusion in my exhibition as it further signifies how the production of community knowledge is subject to ethical values. The third object I have chosen is the Rubens vase and the gaze figure. A popular game my friends and I played during sleepovers was looking at different ink blot tests. It was at this time that my curiosity to learn more about the subjective interpretations of optical illusions peaked. 
Rubens waves is a set of bistable dimensional forms developed around 1915 by Danish psychologist Edgar Rubin. While some see a waves, others see how others see two op opposed faces in profile. This object links to, links to the prompt as it shows how values represented as deeply rooted psychological intentions affect our interpretation of perceptual stimuli as represented by personal knowledge. While we have explored the ways in which values can be both obstacles and driving forces in the production of knowledge, this object shows how values can be a filter through which knowledge is perceived. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Simon. Welcome to my exhibition. The knowledge prompt that I showed is was challenges I think by the dissemination and slash or communication of knowledge. The first object that I chose is a letter from the Adani Group to the Bombay Stock Exchange and the National Stock Exchange of India. I chose this object because of my interest in the Adani Group, which is a multinational conglomerate and one of the leading enterprises in India. This letter speaks about the news article published with respect to the freezing of the company's bank account. The letter claims that the article was published to mislead the investing community by challenging their factual and experiential knowledge. Newspapers are indirectly involved in politics by having the power to change or make the reader's perception favor a particular individual or company by altering their knowledge. In this case, the public is misled as they don't know the full story and there is lack of communication thus in turn leading to confusion and baseless decisions. The second object that I chose is a screenshot of a tweet date made by Elon Musk. It briefly says that Tesla would accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. Being interested in the booming market of cryptocurrency, this was a surprise to me as many governments are still skeptical about the pros and cons of cryptocurrency. So the sudden move of accepting cryptocurrency as a form of payment by one of the most influential businessmen caused a huge uproar amongst the public. This is an example of how influential and authoritative people control prices through the knowledge they possess and the control they hold over financial policy. The dissemination of knowledge in these cases leads people to doubt their own factual and experiential knowledge and believe in the thoughts and ideologies of influential personalities. People in power often misuse their responsibility and go against their values by governing people for personal profit. The third object I chose is an image that compares how fast food brands advertise their food products versus how the products look in reality. There have been multiple instances where I have faced a similar situation. The food I received was nowhere similar to the representation of the food presented in the advertisement. The dispersal of knowledge leads to multiple people like me going to try their food products after being tempted by the visual images. This helps the brand in increasing their revenue and customer base by selling more products. Brands use false advertisement in the form of visual imagery and enhance visual product quality in the advertisement to manipulate their customers and miscommunicate the truth by hiding facts. In the above three cases, we can see how the dissemination and miscommunication of knowledge through media, influential people, and advertisement hinders people from making the rational and well thought out decisions. Welcome to my Kyoka exhibition. My name is Deepika and my prompt is how important are material tools in production or acquisition of knowledge. My first object is a pencil, which is one of the most commonly used tools in our daily lives. When it comes to producing knowledge, it is critical for us to write it down our own thoughts as soon as possible. Material tools such as pencil are useful for us to instantly record our knowledge. Producing knowledge not only entails thinking and creating knowledge, but also recording it in an organized manner so that people in present and future can easily acquire the knowledge. For example, an author must write down their thoughts and story plot in a book in order for it to be produced and published. As a result, readers can gain knowledge from the book through author's writing, which is a community knowledge. My second object is a French translation dictionary. Language is a medium through which we pass on our knowledge. The importance and true meaning of phrases is specific and unique to that particular language, their culture, religion, and historical background that the native speaker can acquire with a detailed understanding of the language. 
even though dictionary help us to acquire vocabulary knowledge and it's impossible to memorize all the words in dictionary to enhance our vocabulary and also it does not ass assist us in gaining the oral fluency my third object is an enigma machine one of the most well known cryptography systems during the world war during the world war second the germans utilized it and claimed it provided them with flawless communication security encoding and sending encrypted messages in order to protect the political and military information was a functioning utility of this machine the enigma operation generates knowledge about how mathematical co concepts are used in the cryptography alan turing who contributed in making the enigma code breaker decrypted the code using the pattern and observation in the messages as well as the mathematical theories which he observed were used to encrypt the message all the three objects contribute to the production of knowledge in their own way thank you hello i'm glennis and this is my theory of knowledge exhibition the gok prompt i've selected is how important are material tools in the production or acquisition of knowledge This exhibition explores my prompt by reflecting on material tools and how they form an integral part in producing knowledge. Knowledge is interpreted in various ways through personal knowledge, community knowledge, scientific knowledge, etc. There are various material tools that help in acquiring the knowledge required. The material tools that I have chosen are thermometer, microscope and compass. My first object is a digital thermometer. Using this thermometer and the information I receive from this, I can acquire knowledge about what are the different units of temperature. and acquire the knowledge of the mechanisms of a thermometer i have included this object in this exhibition because a lot of knowledge is built to the years of knowledge acquired to the trials and wrongs of the making of a thermometer this thermometer is one that i used when recovering from the coronavirus which impacted me in the world on a large scale while being impacted with the virus it also increases my knowledge because it stores data and thus information can be stored and we can get new information from that and acquire knowledge my second object is the compass I have included this object in this exhibition because a lot of knowledge is found in the workings of the compass. This object instills a sense of personal knowledge and community knowledge which is given to me by my elders. It also traces a scientific knowledge like the property of magnetic energy which I learned in my chemistry classes that I acquired through this. This object is mine and is used in real world context. This compass was used in going in desert safaris and day for day to day use. The compass helps me navigate in the real world around me in depth. The third object is the microscope. Using the microscope, I can take in the information and bring knowledge from it. For example, in biology classes, I use the microscope to measure the magnification and then build my knowledge from there. The microscope it ha has helped me navigate the world around me and have an in-depth examination of the species that exist in my realm. Knowledge is acquired through personal knowledge as I use these for scientific experiments. And community knowledge is acquired through my ancestors. The context of the microscope can be seen through different perspectives. Here, knowledge is produced through the conversion of information retrieved from these objects, and knowledge is also produced through the trials and workings of these objects. Scientific milestones and breakthroughs can be reached in using these objects, and if these objects are broken, we can use scientific knowledge in fixing the, those objects. Through these objects, we, as a knower, can acquire knowledge from technology. Thank you. My name is Nikita, and the poem that I have chosen is "What Is the Connection Between Personal Experience and Knowledge?" My first object shows the relationship between creative personal experiences and procedural knowledge. It is a mandala pot that I made using fiber point pens and acrylic paint. While making the design, it kept smudging, so I later experimented with different combinations and found a better alternative. These experiments are creative personal experiences because they're both original and effective, and ultimately resulted in changed procedural knowledge. procedural knowledge being know-how as opposed to conceptual knowledge my second object shows the relationship between personal experience and a posteriori knowledge an experience based knowledge that requires evidence it is the right flyer something we all know as a major milestone in the history of aeronautics the right brothers faced many obstacles while creating the right flyer one of which was their lack of personal experience in some niche areas because of this they relied on previously published experimental data which unfortunately had errors in them and their reliance on this data prevented them from achieving the required results 
that would provide the evidence needed to obtain a posteriori knowledge. In this way, lack of personal experience ultimately prevented them from acquiring knowledge. My third object is my camera, a tool that facilitates photography. Photographs provide undeniable pictorial evidence and a visually sens sensory experience, which help viewers obtain a posteriori knowledge. Historically, photography has been used to document the lives of people and even events in World War II, and helps us today learn about such periods. Therefore, even without us personally experiencing such events, we can sometimes acquire a posteriori knowledge. Additionally, due to its objective nature, the knowledge we acquire from a photograph is based on our personal experience, again evidencing a strong connection between the two. Thank you. to my exhibition. My name is Sitikshu and my prompt is what role do experts play in influencing our consumption or acquisition of knowledge? My objects are a CD marker, a guitar pick and a football. In social media, mainstream media and books, we tend to give experts the benefit of the doubt. In today's world, experts are normally the sources of information that give knowledge to the public. For all these three objects, we can see how an artist, a famous guitarist, and a professional footballer influence the personal knowledge I gain from these objects. In the world we live in, if a professional puts forward their views about a particular object, they influence their watchers as they have the freedom to criticize due to their status as a professional. Experts create knowledge that is easy to understand and they often are descriptive about how they have achieved their results. Experts in any field are trustworthy and credible, but at the same time we tend to favor the views of experts even if it does not affect us at all because of the success they have achieved. In some scenarios, the influence is reliable, but at other times, it's often our mindset and personal knowledge that tends to make us, that, that tends to make us feel that experts' opinion is the best. Experts in a field also tend to help make others take decisions that are pretty heavy in their life and do not lead to a good outcome all the time. In conclusion, the role experts play on us is different in different scenarios, but if I was to generalize, I would say that the image experts portray is often not something we can acquire totally. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Sylvia. Welcome to my exhibition. The knowledge prompt that I chose is can new knowledge change established values and beliefs? And to talk further about it, the first object that I chose is the IB psychology textbook. The reason why I chose a text psychology textbook is because psychology fascinates me. And through this object, I'm exploring how new knowledge that I acquire from the textbook gives me a new perspective and how it changes my learning values and beliefs. Let's just take an example. Uh, let's take the terminology short term memory. My understanding about the concept of short-term memory was completely different from what the concept I had learned from the textbook. The textbook gave me a wider perspective on what the exact meaning was and also helped me self-reflect on the changes that occurred in my learning values over the years. As we acquire new knowledge, the knowledge tends to act like a filter, clarifying doubts and removing misconceptions once I had before. The second object that I choose is a music sheet with musical notations. The reason why I chose this object is because I'm currently learning to play the guitar and the whole process of learning how to play the guitar and read the music sheet with notations is a new knowledge that I'm gaining, which is helping me establish new learning values and build upon my old beliefs. In the olden days, musical notations were either carved on tablets made from clay or manuscripts. Nowadays, we either use a digital platform or a printed paper to read musical notations. These notations establish and create new knowledge in this process. And in this process, old knowledge acts as a pillar of foundation for new knowledge. The third object I, that I chose is a digital painting. The reason I chose a digital painting is because I recently acquired the knowledge to make a digital painting and I'm working towards honing my skills in that field by gaining new knowledge with the help of books and digital platforms. Today, technology plays a huge part in enhancing knowledge and developing the learning values of a knower and changing the established beliefs about how great art can be presented on a sheet of paper or a canvas. 
the digital platform has always been perceived as a pla- just a platform that gives out information but it is also a place where different types of knowledge can be created and acquired by the knower and the doer thereby creating a space where uh, we can expand and establish new values and beliefs all the three objects that i have chosen discuss the impact and effect of new knowledge uh, in application of new knowledge and how new knowledge aids in creation and innovation thank you Hi, my name is Dianshu. My prompt is how important are material tools in the production or acquisition of knowledge. My three objects are my GDC, Bobby Fisher teaches chess, and my iPad. My GDC is a very important aspect of my learning. Not only does it have many useful features, it has one essential tool of graph. Graphing is a visual technique to represent data and show how the nature of data, which can be used to make the predictions for any future data. My GDC has been very useful as it allows me to generalize the shape of a specific type of graph, especially of trigonometric graphs such as sine and cosine graphs, which is widely applied in the AOK of natural sine, and helps me learn the subject. It is also very useful in mathematics and helps me learn the AOK of mathematics as well. Bobby Fischer teaches chess is a book written by the former chess world champion Bobby Fischer. This book focuses on various fundamentals of chess and how to win chess games through pattern work. Chess often boils down to specific patterns through tactics that can lead to victory. These patterns repeat often and this pattern recognition eventually helps uh, helps us prepare in other subjects such as mathematics. This helps me acquire a skill that would fall under the AOK of mathematics. My iPad is a very useful tool for me for the purpose of research. My iPad provides a medium for me to gain knowledge from research papers from the AOK of Natural Sciences and it allows me to annotate those papers to further speed up my learning and remember all the facts and information. My iPad acts as a medium through which I can acquire knowledge in this AOK. That is why I say all these tools help me acquire knowledge. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Shippy and my prompt is what is the relationship between personal experience and knowledge? My first item is a volunteering t-shirt. In the middle of the shirt, the word interact is printed. Interact was a volunteer club that I was part of in the 9th and 10th grade. I got the shirt when I was cleaning up weeds and trash in a public reserve. It was really hard and laborious, but it also changed my perspective on how much I should care for the environment. Because I had to work hard for it, this experience earned me the knowledge of how to be environmentally conscious. My next object is the American driving permit receipt, because the actual permit is not allowed to be pho- photographed. After passing a written exam, a permit allows the person to safely practice with an adult before officially receiving their license to drive alone. This is because driving a car is implicit knowledge, the type of knowledge that exists in a much deeper part of the knower. Despite learning all the theoretical knowledge behind driving, it's not considered enough to actually acquire a license. This is because people must first practice driving in real life to gain a deeper understanding and knowledge on driving. And this object is proof of the connection between personal experience and actually acquiring implicit knowledge. My last object is a book, This Is Going to Hurt, Secret Diaries of a Junior Doctor by Adam Kay. In this diary, he narrates his time working as a doctor overworked, underpaid, discarded, and mistreated. Though Adam Kay got experiential knowledge by experiencing life as a junior doctor, the reader would gain conceptual knowledge. Readers experience the gained knowledge through Kay's point of view, but that doesn't mean that they don't gain any knowledge themselves. Reading the book itself can be considered a personal experience that gains you conceptual knowledge of the struggles of being a doctor. Thus, these are three objects that represent the personal experience and the connect it has with different forms of knowledge. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashwat. The problem that I'm exploring is does some knowledge belong only to particular communities of knowers? The first item that I'm ta- talking about is the red card. The red card in football is used by referees to identify the sent off. The knowledge comes into play here through awareness or familiarity gained by experience of fact or situation. An individual part of the footballing community, such as players and fans, 
could understand the profound impact of this through the transmissional knowledge as they gain the knowledge that the opposing team would have the higher chance to win the game as they would be given the opportunity to score unguarded. This information is transformed into knowledge for members of the football community as they have insight into the rules and regulations of the game, which creates meaning to the red card and thus contextual knowledge. The next item, a multimeter, is one of the most useful tools for any electrical purposes. Medial tools do not promote ideas, hypotheses, or knowledge. In the same way, the multimeter does not produce any type of knowledge. However, an individual can't know whether a hypothesis is true without external validation as knowledge, defined as justified true belief, can, can only be achieved in uh, if the hypothesis is proved to be true. This is where the multimeter comes into play as a tool of the production of knowledge. As the multimeter either validates or discredits a particular idea or hypothesis through the information it provides, thereby providing declarative knowledge. Musical languages are constructed languages based on musical sound, which tend to incorporate articulation. The musical notes here represent the song, I can dream, can't I? However, these notes do not provide somatic knowledge directly. To interpret this knowledge represented, an individual must first know the language it is represented in, and second, the know-how on how to play the guitar. Required to play the song. The prerequisite knowledge is known to the community that is guitar players, which renders the knowledge represented in the musical sheet as knowledge if only the community reading it is able to do so. Hence, the knowledge communicated by the above items belong to certain community of knowers. Hello, my name is Sumiksha, and my prompt is Are some things unknowable? My first object is an ancient Greece vase of Chero, the mythical pyramid of the dead. The Greeks believed that once a person died, their soul would go along with the god Hermes to the underworld. There they would be carried across the river Styx by a ferryman Chero. This object is linked with personal beliefs about religion and what happens after death. However, people of different cultures and religions may come up with different theories. Despite how strange or ridiculous these beliefs may seem, there's no way to prove them to be right or wrong. My second object is, is the Somerton Man Code, which is a cipher found in the poetry book of an unidentified dead man named the Somerton Man in 1948. To this day, the cipher has not been cracked. This has made it next to impossible to further the case and find the identity of the Somerton Man. This object is linked to the role of unshared and personal knowledge of an individual limiting the knowledge of others, leading something to be declared as unknowable. The final object is an image depicting a strange phenomena popular, popularly known as the miracle of the sun. On October 13, 1917, all those present in the Fatima village in Portugal claimed to have seen something strange. They claimed to have seen the sun move in a zigzag fashion. Some claimed that they saw the sun dance and others claimed that they saw bright spots moving around. The question arises, did something really happen on October 1917 that over 30,000 people claim to have seen, or is it something psychological? Thank you. Hi, my name is Pranil and good day everyone. And I'm going to ask you, what is bias? Bias is the tendency to do or believe things affected by external factors, and this can come from your experience, your personal beliefs, and many other reasons. Production of knowledge is generally limited by technology at the time and the perspectives of the people. I say this because through history, there have been many changes to what was once perceived as the truth. These changes occurred due to a bias in the production of knowledge. And this brings me to my prompt, is bias inevitable in the production of knowledge? My first object is a coin, representing statistical probability. The reason for this is because a coin has an equal probability to land on either side, but from trying it on our own, we see that the result often differs. This representation shows us how statistical probability gives us mathematical knowledge, but this can be biased. My second object is a model of the carbon-12 atom. This is used as a standard measure into which all other atomic weights are measured. But before this, oxygen was used. And carbon-12 isn't the perfect atom to do this, but it is only chosen because we believe it provides us with the best way to have standardization. This changes 
how scientific knowledge is perceived. My third object is the model of the solar system. This is one case where the truth has changed with the passing of time. At first, people believed the Earth was at the center of the universe, but with an increase in technology and openness to other perspectives, we now know that this is not the case. For example, the geocentric model was thought to be the truth, and as this was challenged by the Copernican model, we now agree on the latter. This shows how bias coming from time and beliefs affect the production of knowledge. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Roshan. So I have chosen the prompt, what is the relationship between knowledge and culture? The first image chosen is from an article called The Global Reach of US Popular Culture. It communicates the effect of globalization on different cultures. Through this object, through this object, I wish to show how indigenous knowledge is affected by modernization and attraction to Western culture. A lot of individuals in my generation, including myself, use social media, watch Western movies and music belonging to other cultures. These have a large impact on our belief systems and our core values. They help shape our implicit knowledge and this could lead to a loss of indigenous knowledge and have an influence on our perspectives. The second object I have chosen is an Indian hand gesture. Hand gestures are an integral part of the way we communicate with others. Although some are universal, many are specific to a certain culture or region. Since understanding and interpreting these hand gestures are culturally determined, we can call it shared knowledge. Hand gestures from a particular culture are learned from experience and knowledge of hand gestures help construct meaning. My third object is the Gandhi Chakra. We see many cultures may also constitute our, our customs, values, and overall norms of a certain society. We respond to certain situations based on our knowledge of social norms. As a society, we often have certain responsibilities, duties, acts that fit into the norms. So through my third object, I understand how as a society, we need to respect and remember the work done by freedom fighters and and we could be our, and this could act as our non-propositional knowledge. It could also act as a collective obligation to pass on our knowledge to future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have the interactive session, a key aspect of our TOK exhibition. We invite all the teachers and parents to ask the TOK students questions based on their exhibition today. The list of all the students and their respective prompts have been posted in the chat box for your reference. Our goal is to make this interactive session as lively as possible, so all the students will now be turning on their videos, and we'd love it if you could do so when asking your questions as well. Please raise your hand if you do have a question for us, and we can start the interactive session. Ashok will call upon you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Alternatively, if you'd prefer not to unmute, the chat box is open for your questions as well, and we will address all questions in the chat box soon. Srinivasa, do you have a question? Yeah, good morning all. Very good job, children. Uh, very pleasant uh, exhibition. One question to Ashwat. You spoke about a certain knowledge is uh, known to certain communities. Now, we talk in business language as trade secrets. Trade secrets. So how do you link this to your prompt? What is your perspective on this? Yes, sir. I, I agree with it because trade secrets are something that is between a, com a particular organization, a company. So it is bound to those individuals. 
so trade secrets uh, and <coughs> other aspects of it like copyrighted property or copyrighted recipes for maybe big fast food restaurants all of that are aspects of it that are even legally binding to that uh, uh, that particular organization so it is both in the way of knowledge belonging to that community that is the organization and in addition to that even in a legal spectrum it also is belong to the organization therefore i feel that trade secrets are a very good example of a type of knowledge that would be belonging to a particular organization or community thank you ashwat yeah ashwat uh, very well said explained nicely that certain uh, knowledge can belong to a very specific and very uh, small society community Uh, I would like to ask Siti Kshu. Uh, uh, you said experts actually influence the uh, knowledge, or you start believing the experts because uh, you believe that they are authorized to do so because they are experts, right? So the recent event of our famous uh, soccer player Ronaldo. who costed a lot for a company you think that act is justified yes ma'am it, it is, of course it is justified because we can see that how because of his certain action and he has this particular status as one of the best footballers in the world and when a simple gesture of just moving the coke aside cost the company so much damage and it ruined a lot of um, online status become you know it became really popular so i feel like it connecting to my prompt how experts influence the people the public it shows that what power they have what status they have because of their experience so if you were the ceo of the company what would we would have been your approach to this act um to be honest ma'am i would when it comes to a business perspective i would maybe <laughs> promote it more because its reputation has you know its sales probably went down and so i would focus on getting it back up in a particular way okay <laughs> because he was the brand ambassador also for that for your company yes okay. he was so uh, so uh, do you think that uh, that was the creation of knowledge uh, uh, are is he responsible for creating another uh, knowledge saying yes ma'am he is that? because he he put he put that idea into certain people saying uh -huh. that okay if you want to be as successful as him this is how you have to behave this is how you prefer you know non aerated drinks so he's put that idea into certain people he's given certain people knowledge so yeah that's that's it okay good enough <laughs> uh hello everybody um i think uh, this particular tok session has been quite uh, you know knowledgeable and and a lot of information um i was pretty excited to hear what chinma had said um this is about uh, and maybe question for you chinma uh, this is about uh, perception uh, driving the reality uh, you have statements been made in different forums uh, which actually uh, is far off from what the reality is uh, so how do you think uh, a company should respond that whether does really perceptions drive reality or uh, they need to communicate even more okay yes so thank you for your question starting so and uh, Yes, I do think perceptions play a major role because we could see what happened with the company in this case and how they retaliated by sending out a letter to the official partners. But what I feel they could have done is they could have addressed the public or their investors in a more specific manner so that they could gain their customers or their investors' confidence that there would not be any mishappening because of them because it would have large scale implications on the people who have invested a huge amount into their company. so uh, ra rather than uh, sending it directly i feel they should have uh, addressed the stakeholders in a more direct manner okay thanks uh, for that input but the the other thought thought is running in my mind is that 
my experience, I've always seen that uh, you know perception do drive the reality because uh, people do not have the bandwidth to really go into the nativities of information, and the span of information is also so high that people would like to go with their first uh, you know gut feeling. Uh, so how do we address that part of it? Because somewhere within a fraction of a few seconds, the whole credibility of the company you know gets questioned. So how do how do a, an organization look at these kind of things and and how prompt they should be? Okay, so uh, mainly as you mentioned about perception and how that drives the first instinct, that should depend upon the person's experiential knowledge and how well versed they are in the particular topic. So imagine uh, someone might be well versed in the topic of stock markets or they might be knowing what's happening in the financial market. Probably they would be less affected by what's happening and they should get over this wave easily. But probably new investors or people who don't know much about it, they would take this information directly as they do not have the past knowledge about what the company is. So the company should make it quite clear and ensure that this does not happen in the future. They should try and find out what was the reason that it came out in the first place and how they could stop it in the future. Thank you, Jinmay, for your reply. Thank you. And, and all of you, you, do, you all did a fantastic job. I also liked uh, what Sitikshu actually uh, presented and the way he presented. I really am a big fan of Sitikshu now. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sindhavan. Am I uh, audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so I would like uh, Nikita to help me uh, with this question, okay? So you were talking about how your personal experience changed your procedural understanding of uh, procedural knowledge of doing things. And then you went on to talk about other in objects as well. So um, to what extent do you think, uh, you know, um, shared knowledge would help um, develop your own, um, let's say, um, box of knowledge or your own treasure of knowledge? For instance, if, if you had checked, let's say, on the, uh, Google as to why uh, your painting is getting smudged, wouldn't you have got some idea from there? Uh, similarly, uh, the way the Wright brothers came up with the model of their right flyer don't you think that they would have built on the existing uh, you know shared knowledge how do you think we can negotiate to what extent do you think we can negotiate between these two because i feel that this is a basic principle of learning by doing people say that let everybody learn by doing learn from their personal experience and i feel that you know shared knowledge is what we should build on and i was asking i'm asking to what extent do you think we can negotiate between these two to get the best output i hope my question is clear to you uh, yes ma'am so yeah for, for both two of my objects i was spoke about procedural knowledge um so for the first one the mandala port where you said that we i could have relied on the internet to find more information about um, why it was fading or smudging um I actually did, but what I was doing was quite um, new. I had there wasn't actually much information available or shared knowledge available that I could rely on to get information about this specific um, niche topic about like paint uh, pens fading on acrylic paint on a clay pot. Um, but actually, when we're talking about shared knowledge, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation was um, like another problem that I faced when making the pots was that sometimes the design faded, um, and I. I realized that I wasn't able to figure out why at first. And so then that's when I relied on the shared knowledge already produced by the community of artists. And so that taught me that it was because of the water that was there in the pot. Um, so sometimes, yeah, it depends on the topic. And again, for the diet flyer, uh, I think that's what, like, they did rely on shared knowledge, um, the, the data produced by, um, by their predecessors. But again, what happened in that, when they were using that shared knowledge was there were errors in that. So it wasn't actually justified knowledge claims, and that's where the issue came in. So, yeah, I get that. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you, and uh, very good job, everyone. Very well done. Yes, Anuma. Yeah, hello, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is uh, to Pranil. Uh, 
but I think this is for all of you because all of you have used your um, you have invested personally in your knowledge uh, in your objects and you have taken your objects. So the question is about biases and I just wanted to know how much of this personal uh, uh, so when you are picking an object which is very close to your heart, there is def definitely some amount of bias involved in that. So how much of that uh, bias or the personal investment colors your objective investigation of knowledge? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I think. And how do you navigate that? How do you kind of uh, come out of that and look at an object? objectively and look at you know the source of knowledge there okay uh, thank you for the question and i think uh, my thoughts on this are first thing it's not really possible for you know to have uh, ideology about anything without having bias because there is always going to be some amount of bias for anything but then when you're trying to look at anything objectively it is important that you try your best to reduce that bias and you do this by you know you know knowing about that object from different perspectives so the more amount of perspectives you add to, you know, your information on that object, then the knowledge that you get from it will be less biased. And it, of course, it can't be completely without bias, but I think, you know, the wider you go in trying to get as much input in as possible, that will increase the amount of, that will decrease the amount of bias that is there and increase the credibility. That's what I think. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranil, and good job, all of you. Well done and I'm quite impressed. Very well done, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Rajkumar. Yeah, good morning to all. Very happy to see that all of you have uh, uh, given very good uh, sessions. And I thought to ask uh, my question to Sylvia. This is about uh, the, the knowledge change over time. Okay, so the specific question is, have you how do you consider the knowledge changes over time uh, how it affects in a company's uh, uh, in a corporate environment have you thought of uh, that and if so what is your view because we all know that uh, knowledge is always moving so including the beliefs superstitions and everything it changes over time so what is your view on how it can affect the change of knowledge affect in the future of uh, companies per se. OK, uh, thank you for the question. Sir. And uh, yes, as days are progressing, new knowledge, we tend to attain new knowledge. And I also mentioned while I was speaking that new knowledge, when we attain new knowledge, it leads to innovation and creation. So uh, if we are in a like in a corporate, if we are working in a corporate world and uh, you are in a company that is trying to develop something that new knowledge can be used to create and innovate right so yes okay good so uh, just to add on that because uh, uh, in the case of knowledge you know what is relevant maybe 30 years back 20 years back is not may not be relevant now so good that you have uh, touched based on that uh, concept so thank you all it's a very wonderful session and uh, congratulations to everybody Thank you, sir. Uh, since uh, there's a question in the chat box, I would like uh, to uh, recognize it. The question is uh, experts enhance knowledge or Limit exploration. This is to Sadiq Shu. Oh, OK, so um, according to me, I feel like there is both ways, but maybe in today's world, we I feel like experts enhance knowledge because we see how scientists, you know, progress over time and they, you know, go beyond their limits. And I feel like whatever existing knowledge is there before, they try to enhance it and try to improve in the scientific world. But at the same time, experts do sometimes limit knowledge because I feel like um, when it comes to like, I couldn't give a good example, but they tend to favor what they already know and maybe not share it to the world. So 
they you know limit pe- people's knowledge and they t- like stop other people from gaining that knowledge so but i still feel like a majority would like to share it to the world and you know boast about it so i feel like they enhance knowledge in the majority so Hey, um, this is Sridhar. Yes, sir. I'm Adam. Hi. Hi. It's wonderful um, how you have explored and put over plant and various objects. Um, good revelation. Uh, I'm glad that today I could spend my time and visit your exhibition. I have a question for all of you or whoever wants to pick it up. Either you could answer now, and also you can continue in your further exploration um, about this question. You know? So there is something called knowledge quadrant. You must be aware. Uh, in case if you're not aware, it's broadly talks about the actual knowledge in the world, the actual knowledge, and our collective awareness of the knowledge as a y-axis. Actually. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I, I, we, it is a new concept for us. We haven't covered it in TOK okay, now. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, you are not audible. I think the there's a break in uh, voice. Yeah, it's an open-ended question. Am I audible now? There was a brief time my network. Uh, yes, uh, now you're audible, sir. If you could repeat the question, that would be great. So uh, as I said, this question is about uh, there's one important tool for us to structure enter knowledge into a quadrant, um, keeping X dimension as the actual knowledge itself, you know, uh, and a Y dimension, our awareness of the knowledge, you know, I'm glad that by, by spending my time in this TWOK exhibition, I really uh, uh, learned um, the, the way of you exploring the knowledge. So the question here is, um, most of uh, the TOK further exploration you will do will fall into uh, two quarters or three quarters, you know? So my question to all of you is, do you know this quadrant? And where do you think what you are, ex- you know, what you are exhibiting now, learning, will fall into which quadrant? And how do we explore into, um, there is one, key quadrant called, we don't know what we don't know. You know, that is a major dark area. So do you have any thoughts on how we as a collective universe expand our awareness into the area of we don't know what we don't know? Do you have any thoughts and reflections? Uh, just uh, to prod your thoughts, children. Uh, Understand, remember those classes where we discussed about the nature of the knowledge, how it is. Is it in the quadrant? Is it a diamond shape or what shape? Do you remember that? You could answer. Uh, I'll take the time to answer. So, uh, yeah, so you were speaking about the major dark area, about the knowledge we don't know. So about that, I, I don't think we're very aware of it because you did say it was comparison between the knowledge we have and uh what how aware of that knowledge we are so i i doubt we're very aware of it because we don't know what it is we don't understand it in some cases we may be aware that's why research exists people research to find out more knowledge and such but in other cases we're in unexplored areas such as uh let me give the example of how much more we know about the space but less we know about the ocean. That's like where we are not really aware of it because we never try to explore it that much. And while space is the other case, we don't know what's exactly happening, but we're trying to learn more. So you can split split it like that. That's my thought. And can I add to that? Um, 
a, a big theme that we were talking about in TOK throughout the year and a half that we've been learning it is how do we know what we know? So that's kind of like the exact opposite question that we've been discovering and like discovering like, oh, how do we know that we have gained and acquired the knowledge that we have currently? And it's kind of the exact opposite for this, where w how do we know what we don't know? We don't know it, you know? Wow, that was a strange sentence. I apologize. <laughs> but um, it's just like, as you said, a huge dark area. And uh, this connects to a lot of our TOK prompts, especially like Sylvia's, how knowledge is progressing. Because in the beginning of time, we didn't know anything. There. We were cave people, we had no progression of knowledge. And as time continues on, we continue to gain and progress in our knowledge acquisition. And I feel like there's, even though there is a huge dark area of what we don't know, and it will continue to stay there as a, as a society, we progress with our acquisition of knowledge, slowly and slowly, like small components of that dark space will come into our knowledge area as we like continue with our technology and a progression of technology and our experts and everything. So I think, in my opinion, that dark spot of how do we know what we don't know will always exist because there will we will never be able to, to discover everything, but it will slowly be, um, parts of it will slowly be converted to our own personal knowledge. Absolutely, appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sridhar, uh, this is Archana, their TOK teacher. Can I amend their uh, answers for you? Uh, in TOK course, we take knowledge as um, uh, not as actual or uh, um, actual or objective knowledge or some that kind of a thing. Uh, graphically representing, we can represent as a sphere which doesn't have a beginning or the end. That's the concept I have taught them, uh, but right now it is not kind of uh, connecting to them. Uh, so therefore, uh, we don't take uh, in TOK that uh, uh, knowledge can be uh, graphically shared or, or represented. So that's how the concept of uh, knowledge in TOK is built up. Uh, it is a kind of a little different from uh, other uh, areas of knowledge. Um, it is based on philosophical idea of knowledge, which uh, doesn't have a kind of a linear progression or geometric progression or graphical progression to represent for. I hope yeah, I thank you. you. No, no, thank you so much. I, I resonate with you, Achana ma'am, but I really appreciate how the, um, the your IBNs have responded to uh, the so something yes, I threw at them. I, I, no? I do. Um, so, uh, yes. I, so before I go on mute, um, I think the path for discovering what we don't know that we don't know is really knowing what we don't know. For example, last uh, uh, 50 minutes I spent, there are some areas it came to my awareness that I don't know. So what we know, you all of you are exploring, of course, good that you are going philosophical multiple dimensions that will give a, a trail to uh, assimilate the knowledge and make it uh, utilization the way it develops our personality. But one access is, we know that I don't know this. That itself is, is exploration. And I have my takeaways, few areas. Now I realize I don't have about this. So I'll, I'll make my effort to know more about it, uh, perhaps in unbiased way or limit, limiting my bias towards it. Uh, so the moment, as Pranil was telling, the moment we limit our bias, invite additional perspectives, Definitely, we, we acquired the knowledge in, 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 you know, so that's a quest. It's a continuous journey. With that, I'll sign off. Thank you so much, kids. Thank you so much, ma'am and uh, CJC. Wonderful. Our time has been well spent. Thank you, sir. Um, since there's no other hands raised or questions in the chat box, I think we can proceed to the vote of thanks. Um, okay, so with this, we come to the end of the interactive session. Um, next to the vote of thanks, uh, so Vagi so has been instrumental in organizing the exhibition today and was there by our side through every step of the journey. Whether it was early morning calls or late night doubts, he was there every step of the way and this exhibition would not have been possible without him. We thank you, sir, for your support and we invite you to give the vote of thanks.
Am I audible? Oh, yes, sir, you are. Oh. A, a good friend of Socrates once asked the oracle at Delphi, is anyone wiser than Socrates? The oracle answered, no one. So this greatly puzzled Socrates, Socrates since uh, he claimed to possess no secret information or wise insight. As far as Socrates, Socrates was concerned, he was the most ignorant man in the land. Socrates was determined to prove the oracle wrong. He told Athens up and down, talking to the wisest and the most capable people, trying to find someone wiser than he was. What he found was that poets did not know why their words moved people, or craftsmen knew only how to master their trade and not much else, and politicians thought that they were wise but did not have the knowledge to back it up. Now, what Socrates discovered was that none of these people knew anything, but they all thought that they did. Socrates concluded he was wiser than them because he at least knew that he did not know nothing. As we come to the end of Knowledge at Edge, Cryogenic College IBDP's very own maiden theory of knowledge, exhibition that carries on the tradition of this Socratic paradox, ironically, I intend to claim that I do know something. It is a knowledge that this event would not have been the success that it would uh, it, it is without the contribution of all those who have worked hard to make it happen. Achana ma'am, thank you for showing the light of knowledge and developing TOK thinking in our entire IBDP cohort, teachers and students included. I request the gathering to give her a, give her a round of applause. Thank you. Sheila ma'am. Thank you for guiding us at every step. I thank all the teachers thank for you, integrating, integrating TOK in the curriculum at every step. A big round of applause mm -hmm. for the entire teaching community at Cry Junior College. I thank parents for all the support you have provided, especially being here today. Uh, keeping aside all your other work and being part of this journey, it makes teaching and learning process at CJC IBDP complete on behalf of entire teaching community and the student community at Christ Junior College. I give a big round of applause to all of you and thank you for being part of this journey. And I hope that you continue to support us this way, the way that you have supported us. And a shout out to the teamwork of our DP2 students. They have all worked on this assessment component in all sincerity and displayed IB learner profile traits. More than the assessment bit, I think they have enjoyed this journey of learning and in, uh, internalized uh, whatever they have gained through this process. But my vote of thanks would be incomplete without making a special mention of some of them without whose sense of service this even could not have been conceived and executed the way it's been done today. Roshan, ably supported by Dianchu, spent countless hours exploring the nitty gritty of how to make the, the video that you saw uh, that you saw of virtual exhibition happen in Art Steps Gallery. Sylvia, along with them, spent hours designing the aesthetics of the virtual stalls and designing the invite. I thought most of uh, uh, the, the the documents and uh, you know uh, this exhibition itself looked aesthetically pleasing be because of her initiative. She was also supported by Deepika. A big round of applause to all these. Two. Shruti collected the, uh, co coordinated the collection of exhibits and did a commendable job of handling the inter-team communication to provide necessary support to the designing team. And I must say, all of them um, coordinated uh, and, and cooperated with her when, when she asked for something so that the designing team could put things in order on time and make this event happen so successfully. Before I conclude, my vote of thanks would be incomplete without thanking Father Sebastian, our principal, and Father Peter, our vice principal in absentia, 
for their guidance and support because they they give us the infrastructure the environment and have created this collaborative culture where this kind of a learning exercise is possible thank you fathers thank you so much and thank you everyone once again for being here if i have forgotten to mention someone their minor contribution or major contribution kindly forgive me i thank you once again from the core of my heart thank you yes. Manoj, you have forgotten one person. Uh, I think uh, okay. I thank Ashwat and Nikita for uh, anchoring today's events and Sitikshu for handing the tech. Uh, Archana, ma'am. No, not that. Um, not that. Uh, it is Mr. Manoj Vargis who relentlessly worked behind the scenes, uh, coordinating with the students, coordinating with the Sheila, ma'am, coordinating with me, and <laughs> all exhibition is all his work. Thank yes. you so much, man. No, no, not my work. It's, it's, it's. I think it's all of us put together, and all so of this... all the teachers who are here, and you know, um, have come up with these questions. I was in, in fact worried as to how the interaction round would go. Though Arjuna ma'am told me, don't worry. Uh, I, I was a little worried. What if people don't ask questions? But I'm so happy that the students <laughs> were, you know, <laughs> students okay. were, uh, you know, like um, so inspiring that we had no other choice but to ask questions. Uh, and the major takeaway for me personally is that I know, uh, know what all and how I can integrate TOK better uh, in this whole process. And, and sorry for my son photobombing the, the occasion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, we can finish the meeting. Uh, back Manoj? to uh, yeah. So back to uh, Ashwat and Nikita. MCC, yeah, Ashwat and Nikita. This concludes our event for today. Thank you for attending, each and every one of you, the teachers, parents, and of course the year two students. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Uh, do give us your feedback. Do let us know. We will remain in touch.